everybody, and welcome to NAU Theater Story Hour. This is broadcast 14, and we are getting close to the end of our chapter books. We're looking forward for you to hear the end and what happens in some of our stories. And for the next few weeks, we'll probably be ending one or two a day. So we better get started if we're gonna do that. So enjoy and I'll see you soon. Today's storybooks are The Story of Dr. Doolittle, White Fang, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, and we have some stories that we know you'll enjoy. Today's extra stories are short stories for our younger listeners. These stories are for ages five to nine. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. So last week we did finish Cinderella, but no fear because this week we're back and I'm going to be reading to you guys The Golden Goose and the Story of the Three Little Bears. But today we're gonna to start with The Golden Goose. You guys ready? Here we go. Thereupon, the second son went into the wood, and the mother gave him, as she had given to the eldest, a sweet cake and a bottle of wine. The little old man met him also and begged for a small slice of the cake and a drink of wine, but the second son spoke out quite plainly, what I give to you, I lose myself. Be off with you. And he left the little man standing there and walked on, Punishment was no long in coming to him, for he had given but two strokes at a tree when he cut his legs so badly that he had to be carried home. In this way, they came to a city where a king reigned, who had an only daughter, who was so serious that no one could make her laugh. Therefore, he had announced that whoever should make her laugh should have her for his wife. When the simpleton had heard this, he went with his goose and his train before the princess, and when she saw the seven people all running behind each other, she began to laugh. And she laughed and laughed till it seemed as though she could never stop. Thereupon, the simpleton demanded her for his wife, but the king was not pleased at the thought of such a son-in-law, and he made all kinds of objections. He told the simpleton that he must first bring a man who could drink off a whole cellar full of wine. At once, the simpleton thought of the little gray man who would be sure to help him. So off he went into the wood and in the place where he had cut down the tree, he saw a man sitting who looked most miserable. The simpleton asked him what was the cause of his trouble. I have such a thirst, the man answered and I cannot quench it, I cannot bear cold water. I have indeed emptied a cask of wine, for what is a drop like that to a thirsty man? In that case, I can help you, said the simpleton. Just come with me and you shall be satisfied. He led him to the king, who meanwhile had ordered all the meal in the kingdom to be brought together and an immense mountain of bread baked into it. The man from the wood set to work on it and in one day, the whole mountain had disappeared. For the third time, the simpleton demanded his bride, but yet again, the king tried to put him off and said that he must bring him a ship that would go both on land and water. If you are really able to sail such a ship, said he, you shall at once have my daughter for your wife. The simpleton went into the wood and there sat the little old gray man to whom he had given his cake. I have drunk for you and I have eaten for you, said the little man, and I will also give you the ship. All this I do because you were kind to me. Then he gave the simpleton a ship that went both on land and water, and when the king saw it, he knew he could no longer keep back his daughter. The wedding was celebrated, and after the king's death, the simpleton inherited the kingdom and lived very happily ever after with his new wife. Thank you guys. See you guys later. Next up, we have The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Enjoy. Hi guys. Um, so we're continuing with The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Last time, we read about how Robin Hood got himself into some trouble um, pretending to be a butcher and giving all his meat away for pennies. Um, and today, 
we start our chapter, um, Little John Goes to Nottingham Fair. Spring had gone since the sheriff's feast in Sherwood, and summer also, and the mellow month of October had come. All the air was cool and fresh, the harvests were gathered home, the young birds were full-fledged, the hops were plucked, and apples were ripe. But though time had so smoothed smooth things over that men no longer talked of the horned beasts that the sheriff wished, wished to buy, he was still sore about the matter and could not bear bear to hear Robin Hood's name spoken in his presence. With, with October had come the time for holding, holding the great fair, which was celebrated every five years at Nottingham Town, to which folks came from far and near th throughout the country. At such times, archery were always the main sport of the day, for Nottinghamshire yeomen were the best, best hand of the longbow in all merry England. But this year, the sheriff hesitated for a long time before he issued the proclamation of the fair, fear, fearing lest Robin Hood and his band might come to it. At first, he had a great part in mind to not proclaim the fair, but second thought told him the men would all laugh at him and say among, amongst themselves that he was afraid of Robin Hood. So he put that thought by. At last, he fixed in his mind that he would offer such a prize as they would not care to shoot for. At such times, it had been the custom to offer a half score of marks or a tune of ale. So for this year, he pro proclaimed the prize of two fat steers should be given to the best bowmen. When Robin Hood heard, heard what had been proclaimed, he, he was vexed. Now beshrew the sheriff that he should offer such a prize that none but Shepherd Hines should care to shoot for. I would have loved nothing better than to have another bout at Mary Nottingham Town, but if I should win this prize, not it would pleasure me or proffer me. Then spoke Little John. Nay, but hearken, good master, said he. Only today will Stutley, young David of Doncaster, and I were at the sign of the Blue Boar, and there we heard the news of this merry fair, and also that the sheriff hath offered his prize. We of Sherwood might not come to the fair, so, good master, if thou wilt, I would go to the fair and strive to win even this poor thing amongst the stout yeomen who will shoot at Nottingham Town. Nay, little John, quoth Robin, thou art a stout fellow, yet thou lackest cunning, and that good Stutley, and that good Stutley hath, and I would not have harm befall thee for all Nottinghamshire. Nevertheless, if you will go, take some disguise, lest, lest there be those who may know thee. So be it, good master, quoth Little John. Yet all disguise that I wish is a good suit of scarlet instead of this Lincoln green. I will draw a cow my jacket about my head, so it will hide my, my brown hair and beard, and then, I trust, no one will know me. It is much against my will, said Robin Hood. Nevertheless, if thou dost wish it, get thee gone, but bear thyself seemingly, little John, for thou art my own right-hand man, and I could ill bear to have, ha have harm befall thee. So little John clad himself all in scarlet and started to the fair at Nottingham Town. Right merry were these fair days at Nottingham when the green when the green before the great town gate was dotted with booths standing in rows, with many tents with many tents of colored canvas hung, hung about with streamers and garlands of flowers, and the folks came from all the countryside, both gentle and common. In some booths there was dancing to merry music, and others flowed ale and beer, and, and yet others again with sweet cakes and barley sugar were sold. And sport was going on outside the booths also, where some, where some minstrels sang ballads of the olden time, playing playing a, upon a harp over the over the wrestlers wrestlers struggled with one another in the sawdust ring but people gathered most of all around the raised platform where stout fellows played at quarter staff and so little john came to the fair all scarlet were his hose and jerkin and scarlet he was cow was his cowled cap with a, with a scarlet feather stuck in the side of it over his shoulders was slung a stout bow of view, and across his back hung a quiver of good round arrows. Many turned to look 
look after such a stout, tall fellow, for his shoulders were broader by a palm's breadth than any that were there, and he stood a head taller th than any other man. The lasses also looked at him, thinking they had never seen a lustier youth. First of all, he went to the booth where the stout ale was sold, and standing aloft on, on a bench, he called to all that were near to come and drink with him. Hey, sweet lads, cried he, who will drink with the stout yeoman? Come all, come all, let us be merry, for the day is sweet and the ale is tingling. Come hither, good yeoman, and thou, and thou, and for not a farthing of shall for not a farthing shall one of you pay. Nay, turn hither, thou lusty beggar, and thou jolly tinker, for thou shalt be merry with me. Thus he shouted, and all the crowd around, <laughs> laughing, while the brown ale flowed. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys, that's my dog. And they called Little John a brave fellow, each swearing that they loved him as his own brother. For when one has entertainment with, with nothing to pay, one loves the man that that gives it to one. Then he strolled to the platform where they were at cudgel play, for he loved a bout of quarterstaff as, as he loved meat and drink. And here befell an adventure that was sung in ballads throughout, throughout the mid country for many a day. One fellow there was crack, that was cracked crowns of everyone who threw cap into the ring. There was Eric of Lincoln, the great renown, whose name had been sung in ballads throughout the countryside. When Little John reached the stand, he found none fighting, but only bold Eric walking up and down the platform, swinging his staff and shouting lustily, Now who will come and stroke for the lass he loves best with a good Lincolnshire yeoman? How now, lads, step up, step up, or else the lass's eyes are not bright hereabouts, or the blood of Nottingham youth is sluggish and cold. Lincoln against Nottingham, I say I, for no one hath hath put foot upon the boards this day of such we Lincoln call a cudgel player. At this, one would nudge another with his elbow, saying, Go thou, Ned, or go thou, Thomas. But no lad cared to gain a cracked crown for nothing. Presently, Eric saw where little John stood among the others, and a head, a head and shoulder above them all, and he called out to him loudly, Helloa, long-legged fellow in the scarlet, broad are thy shoulders and thick is thy head. Is, is not thy lass fair enough to take cudgel in hand for her sake? In truth, I believe Nottingham men do, do bone and do turn to bone and sinew, for neither heart nor courage have they. Now thou great lout, will thou not twirl staff for Nottingham? Ay, quoth little John. Had I but mine own staff here, it would pleasure me hugely to crack th thy knave's pate, thou saucy braggart. I wot, I wot it would be well, for, for thee and thy yeah. coxcomb were cut. Thus he spoke slowly at first, her, for he was slow to move, but his wrath gathered, gathered headway like a great stone rolling down a hill, and so yeah. at the end he was full of anger. Then Erica Lincoln laughed and shouted, Well spoken for one who fears to, to meet me fairly, man to man, said he. Saucy art thou for thine own self, and if thou puttest foot upon these boards, I will make thy saucy tongue rattle within thy teeth. Now, quoth Little John, is there never a man that will lend me a good stout staff that I try the metal of yon fellow? At this, half a score reached, reached him their staves, and he looked, and he took the stoutest, and heaviest of them all. Then, looking up and down the cudgel, he said, Now if I have in my hand but a splint of wood, barely a straw as it were, yet I trow it will have to serve me here. So here goeth. Thereupon he cast he cast his cudgel upon the stand, and leaping lightly after it, snatched it, snatched it up in his hand again. Then each man stood in his place and measured the other, with fell looks that he directed upon the, the sport, cried, play and uh, and this they stepped at this they stepped forth each grasping his his staff tightly in the middle then those who stood around the stoutest game of quarter staff that ever nottingham town beheld at first eric of lincoln thought he would gain easy advantage so he came forth as if he would say 
Watch, good people, how I carve this young cockard right speedily. But he presently found, found it to be no such speedy matter. Right deftly he was struck with, with skill of great fence, but he had found his match in Little John. Once, twice, thrice he struck, and three times Little John turned the blows to thy left hand and to thy right. Then quickly and with dainty back, back at blows, he wrapped Eric beneath his guard so shrewdly that it was that it made his head ring. Then Eric stepped back to gather his wits, while a great shout went up, and all were glad that Nottingham had cracked Lincoln's crown. Thus ended the first bout of the game. And then presently, the director of the sport cried, Play! And they came together again, but now Eric played warily, for he found that this man was of right good metal, and also he ha he had no sweet memory of the blow that he had got. So this bout, so this bout, neither Little John nor the Lincoln man caught a stroke within his guard. Then, after a while, they parted again, and this made the second bout. Then, for the third time, they came together. And at first Eric strove to be wary, as he had been before, but growing mad and finding himself so foiled, he lost his wits and began to rain blows so fiercely and so fast they rattled like a hail on a penthouse roof. But in spite of all this, he did not reach within Little John's guard. Then at last Little John saw his chance, and he seized it, seized it right cleverly. Once more, with a qu quick blow, he wrapped Eric beside the head, ere he could regain himself. Little John slipped his right his right hand down his left with a swinging blow, smote the other so sor sorely upon the crown that down he fell as though he would never move again. Then people shouted so loud that folks came running from all about to see what was the ado when Little John leapt down from the stand and gave staff back to him that had lent it to him, and thus ended and thus ended the famous bout between Little John and Erica Lincoln, Lincoln of the great renown. But now a time had come for those who were to shoot with the long bow were to take to their place. So people began flocking to the butts where the shooting was to be. Near the target, in a good place, sat the sheriff upon his raised dais with many gentlefolk around him. When the archers had taken their place, the herald came forward and, pro and proclaimed the rules of the game and how each should shoot three shots and to him that should shoot the best shoot the best the prize of two fat steers was to belong a score of brave shots were gathered there and among them some of the keenest hands at the long bow in in lincoln and nottinghamshire in lincoln and nottinghamshire and among them was little john who stood taller than the rest who is yon stranger clad all in scarlet said some and others answered it is he hath but so soundly cracked upon eric of lincoln Thus people talked among themselves, until it at last reached even the sheriff's ears. And now each man stepped forward and shot in, in turn, but, but though each shot went well, Little John was the best of all, for three times he had struck, struck the cloud, and, and once only the length of a barley corn from the center. Hey for the tall archer, shouted the crowd, and some among them shouted, Hey, for Reynold Greenland, for this was the name that Little John had called himself that day. The sheriff stepped, stepped down from the raised seat and came, and came to where the archer stood, while all doffed their caps that saw him coming. He looked keenly at Little John, but did not know him, though he said after a while, How now, good fellow? Methinks there is something about that face that I have seen erewhile. Mayhaps it may be so, quoth Little John, for often I have seen your worship. As he spoke, he looked steadily into the sheriff's eyes so that the latter did not suspect who he was. A brave blade out art thou, good fellow, said the sheriff, and I had heard that thou well upheld the skill of Nottinghamshire against that, against that of Lincoln of this day. What may be thy name, good fellow? Men do call me Reynold Greenleaf, your worship, said Little John. And the, and the old ballad that tells of this adds, So in truth was he a green leaf, but of what matter of the tree of the sheriff wotted not.
Now, Ronald Greenleaf, quoth the sheriff, thou art the fairest, fairest hand at the longbow that mine eyes ever behold. Next to that knave Robin Hood, from who, from who whiles heaven forfend me, wilt thou join my service, good fellow? Thou shalt be paid right well for three suits, three suits of clothes thou shalt have a year, with good food and as much ale as thou thou canst drink. And besides this, I will pay thee forty marks each. Each Michael must die. Then here I stand a free man, and right right gladly will, will I enter thy household, said Little John, for he thought he might have find some merry jest should he enter the sheriff's service. Fairly thou hast won the fat steers, said the sheriff, and hereunto I will add a butt of good March beer. For joy of having gotten such a man, I wot, thou shootest as fair a shaft as Robin Hood himself. Then said little john for joy of having gotten myself into thy service i will give fat steers and brown ale to all these good folks to make them merry withal at this arose a great shout many wow. casting their caps aloft for joy of the gift then some had built great fires and roasted the steers and others broached the bud of ale with which all made, made themselves merry then when they had eaten eaten as drunk as much as eaten and drunk as much as they could and when the day faded the great moon arose and uh, and and all red and round over their spires and towers of nottingham town they joined hands and danced and danced around the fires to the music of bagpipes and harps but long before this merry-making had begun the sheriff the sheriff and his new servant reynold greenleaf were in the castle of nottingham next up we have Mr. Nathaniel reading White Fang. White Fang by Jack London, Part Two, Chapter Four, The Wall of the World. By the time his mother began leaving the cave on hunting expeditions, the cub had learned well the law that forbade his approaching the entrance. Not only had this law been forcibly and many times impressed on him by his mother's nose and paw, but in him the instinct of fear was developing. Never in his brief cave life had he encountered anything of which to be afraid, yet fear was in him. It had come down to him from a remote ancestry through a thousand, thousand lives. It was a heritage he had received directly from one eye and the she-wolf, but to them in turn it had been passed down through all the generations of wolves that had gone before. Fear that legacy of the wild which no animal may escape, nor exchange for potage. So the gray cub knew fear, though he knew not the stuff of which fear was made. Possibly he accepted as one of the restrictions of life, for he had already learned that there were such restrictions. Hunger he had known, and when he could not appease his hunger, he had felt restriction. The hard obstruction of the cave wall, the sharp nudge of his mother's nose, the smashing stroke of her paw, the hunger unappeased of several famines, had borne in upon him that all was not freedom in the world, that to life there was limitations and restraints. These limitations and restraints were laws. To be obedient to them was to escape hurt and make for happiness. He did not reason the question out in this man fashion. He merely classified the things that hurt and the things that did not hurt. And after such classification, he avoided the things that hurt and the restrictions and restraints in order to enjoy the satisfactions and the remunerations of life. Thus, it was that in obedience to the law laid down by his mother, in obedience to the law of that unknown and nameless thing, fear, he kept away from the mouth of the cave. It remained to him a white wall of light when his mother was absent, he slept most of the time, while during the intervals that he was awake, he kept very quiet, suppressing the whimpering cries that tickled in his throat and strove for noise. Once, lying awake, he heard a strange sound in the white wall. He did not know that it was a wolverine standing outside, all a-trembling with its own daring and cautiously scenting out the contents of the cave. The cub knew only that the sniff was strange, uh, something unclassified, therefore unknown and terrible, for the unknown was one of the chief elements that went into the making of fear. 
The hair bristled upon the gray cub's back, but it bristled silently. How was he to know that the thing that sniffed was a thing at which to bristle? It was not born of any knowledge of his, yet it was the visible expression of the fear that was in him and for which, in his own life, there was no accounting. But fear was accompanied by another instinct, that of concealment. The cub was in a frenzy of terror, yet he lay without movement or sound, frozen, petrified into immobility, to all appearances dead. His mother, coming home, growled as she smelt the wolverine's track and bounded into the cave and licked and nozzled him with undue vehemence of affection. And the cub felt that somehow he had escaped a great hurt. But there were other forces at work in the cub, the greatest of which was growth. Instinct and law demanded of him obedience, but growth demanded disobedience. His mother, in fear, impelled him to keep away from the white wall. Growth is life, and life is forever destined to make for light, so there was no damming up the tide of life that was rising within him, rising with every mouthful of meat he swallowed, with every breath he drew. In the end, one day, Fear and obedience were swept away by the rush of life, and the cubs straddled and sprawled toward the entrance. Unlike any other wall with which he had had experience, this wall seemed to recede from him as he approached. No hard surface collided with the tender little nose he thrust out tentatively before him. The substance of the wall seemed to as permeable and yielding as light and as condition in his eyes had the seeming of form, so he entered in what had been walled to him and bathed in the substance that composed it. It was bewildering. He was sprawling through solidity, and ever the light grew brighter. Fear urged him to go back, but growth drove him on. Suddenly he found himself at the mouth of the cave. The wall inside which he had thought himself as suddenly leaped back before him into an immeasurable distance. The light had become painfully bright. He was dazzled by it. Likewise, he was made dizzy by this abrupt and tremendous extension of space. Automatically, his eyes were adjusting themselves to the brightness, focusing themselves to meet the increased distance of objects. At first, the wall had leaped beyond his vision, and he now saw it again, but it had taken upon itself remarkable remoteness. Also, its appearance had changed. It was now a variegated wall composed of the trees that fringed the stream, the opposing mountain that towered above the trees, and the sky that out-towered the mountain. A great fear came upon him. This was more of the terrible unknown. He crouched down on the lip of the cave and gazed out on the world, he was very much afraid. Because it was unknown, it was hostile to him. Therefore, the hair stood up on end along his back and his lips wrinkled weakly in an attempt at a ferocious and intimidating snarl. Out of his puniness and fright, he challenged and menaced the whole wide world. Nothing happened. He continued to gaze and in his interest, he forgot to snarl. Also, he forgot to be afraid. For the time, Fear had been routed by growth, while growth had assumed the guise of curiosity. He began to notice near objects in open portion of the stream that flashed in the sun, and the blasted pine tree that stood at the base of the slope, and the slope itself that ran right up to him and ceased two feet beneath the lip of the cave in which he crouched. Now the gray cub had lived all his days on a level floor. He had never experienced the hurt of a fall. He did not know what a fall was, so he stepped boldly out upon the air. His hind legs still rest on the cave lip, so he fell forward, head downward. The earth struck him a harsh blow on the nose that made him yelp. Then he began rolling down the slope over and over. He was in a panic, and a, he was in a panic of terror. The unknown had caught him at last. He had gripped savagely hold of him and was about to wreak upon him some terrific hurt. Growth was now routed by fear, and he kayied like a frightened puppy. And the unknown bore it on him. He knew not what the frightful hurt, and he yelped and kayied unceasingly. This was a different proposition from a crouching and frozen fear, while the unknown lurked just alongside. Now the unknown had caught tight hold of him. 
Silence would do no good. Besides, it was not fear, but terror that convulsed him. But the slope grew more gradual, and its base was grass-covered. Here the cub lost momentum. When at last he came to a stop, he gave one last agonized yell and then a long, whimpering wail. Also, and quite as a matter of course, as though in his life he had already made a thousand toilets, he proceeded to lick away the dry clay that soiled him. After that, he sat up and gazed about him, as might the first man of the earth who landed upon Mars. The cub had broken through the wall of the world. The unknown had let go its hold of him, and here he was without hurt. But the first man on Mars would have experienced less unfamiliarity than he did, without any antecedent knowledge, without any warning whatever that such existed. He found himself an explorer in a totally new world. Now that the terrible unknown had let go of him, he forgot that the unknown had any terrors. He was aware only of curiosity and all the things about him. He inspected the grass beneath him, the mossberry plant just beyond, and the dead trunk of the blasted pine that stood on the edge of an open space among trees. A squirrel running around the base of the trunk came full upon him and gave him a great fright. He cowered down and snarled, but the squirrel was as badly scared and ran up the tree and from a point of safety chattered back savagely. This helped the cub's courage and Though the woodpecker he next encountered gave him a start, he proceeded confidently on his way. Such was his confidence that when a moose bird impudently hopped up to him, he reached out at it with a playful paw. The re result was a sharp peck at the end of his nose that made him cower down and kai -ai. The noise he had made was too much for the moose bird who sought safety in flight. But the cub was learning. His misty little mind had already made an unconscious classification. There were live things and things not alive. Also, he must watch out for the live things. The things not alive remained always in one place, but the, things, the, but the live things moved about, and there was no telling what they might do. The thing to expect of him was the unexpected, for this he must be prepared. He traveled very clumsily. He ran into sticks and things, a twig that he thought a long way off would, would the next instant hit him on the nose or rake along his ribs. These were inequalities of surface. Sometimes he overstepped and stubbed his nose. Quite as often he understepped and stubbed his feet. Then there were the pebbles and stones that turned under him when he trod upon them, and from them he came to know that the things not alive were not all in the same state of stable equi equilibrium as was his cave. Also, that small things not alive were more liable than large things to fall down or turn over. But with the, every mishap, he was learning. The longer he walked, the better he walked. He was adjusting himself. He was learning to calculate his own muscular movements, to know his physical limitations, to measure distances between objects and between objects in himself. He was the luck of the beginner. His was the luck of the beginner, born to be a hunter of meat, though he did not know it. He blundered upon meat just outside his own cave door on his first foray into the world. It was by sheer blundering that he chanced upon the shrewdly hidden ptarmigan nest. He fell into it. He had essayed to walk along the trunk of a fallen pine. The rotten bark gave way under his feet, and with a despairing yelp, he pitched down the rounded crescent, smashed through the leafage and stalks of small bush, and in the heart of the bush on the ground, fetched up the midst of seven ptarmigan chicks. They made noises, and at first he was frightened at them. Then he perceived that they were very little, and he became bolder. They moved. He placed his paw in one, and its movements were accelerated. This was a source of enjoyment to him. He smelled it. He picked it up in his mouth. It struggled and tickled his tongue, and at the same time he was made aware of a sensation of hunger. His jaws closed together. There was a crunching of fragile bones, and warm blood ran in his mouth. The taste of it was good. This was meat, the same as his mother gave him, only it was alive between his teeth and therefore better. So he ate the ptarmigan, nor did he stop till he had devoured the whole brood. Then he licked his chops in quite the same way his mother did and began to crawl out of the, of the bush. He encountered a feathered whirlwind. He was confused and blinded by the rush of it and the beat of angry wings. He hid his head between his paws and yelped. The blows increased. The mother ptarmigan was in a fury. 
Then he became angry. He rose up, snarling, striking out with his paws. He sank his tiny teeth into one of the wings and pulled and tugged sturdily. The ptarmigan struggled against him, showered blows upon him with her free wing. It was his first battle. He was elated. He forgot all about the unknown. He no longer was afraid of anything. He was fighting, tearing at, the, uh, at a live thing that was striking at him. Also, this live thing was meat. The lust to kill was on him. He had just destroyed little live things. He would now destroy a big live thing. He was too busy and happy to know that he was happy. He was thrilling and exulting in ways new to him and greater to him than any he had known before. He held on to the wing and growled between his tight clenched teeth. The ptarmigan dragged him out of the bush. When she turned and tried to drag him back into the bush's shelter, he pulled her away from it and on, and on into the open. And all the time she was making outcry and striking with her free wing while feathers were flying like snowfall. The pitch to which he aroused was tremendous. All the fighting blood of his, of his breed was up in him and surging through him. This was living, though he did not know it. He was realizing his own meaning in the world. He was doing, what for, he was doing that for which he was made, killing meat and battling to kill it. He was justifying his existence, then which, uh, then which life can do no greater. For life achieves its summit when it does to the uttermost that which it was equipped to do. After a time, the ptarmigan ceased her struggling. He still held her by the wing and they lay on the ground and looked at each other. He tried to growl threateningly, ferociously. She pecked on his nose, which by now, what of previous adventures was sore. He winced but held on. She pecked him again and again. From wincing, he went to whimpering. He tried to back away from her, oblivious to the fact that by his hold on her, he dragged her after him. A rain of pecks fell on his ill-used nose. The flood of fight ebbed down to him, and releasing his prey, he turned tail and scampered on across the open in inglorious retreat. He lay down to rest on the other side of the open, near the edge of the bushes, his tongue lolling about, his chest heaving and panting, his nose still hurting him and causing him to continue his whimper. But as he lay there, suddenly there came to him a feeling as some something terrible and impending. The unknown with all its terrors rushed upon him and he shrank back instinctively into the shelter of the bush. As he did so, a draft of air fanned him and a large winged body swept ominously and silently past. A hawk driving down to the blue had barely missed him. While he lay in the bush, recovering from his fright and peering fearfully out, the mother ptarmigan on the other side of the open space fluttered out of the ravaged nest. It was because of her loss that she paid no attention to the winged bolt of the sky. But the cub saw, and it was a warning and a lesson to him, the swift downward swoop of the hawk, the short skim of its body just above the ground, and the strike of its talons in the body of the ptarmigan. The ptarmigan squawk of agony and fright, and the hawks rush upward into the blue, carrying the ptarmigan away with it. It was a long time before the cub left its shelter. He had learned much. Live things were meat. They were good to eat. Also, live things, when they were large enough, could give hurt. It was better to eat small live things like ptarmigan ch chicks and to let alone large live things like ptarmigan hens. Nevertheless, he felt a little prick of ambition, a sneaking desire to have another battle with that ptarmigan hen, only the hawk had carried her away. Maybe there were other ptarmigan hens. He would go and see. He came down a shelving bank to the stream. He had never seen water before. The footing looked good. There were no inequalities of surface, so he stepped boldly out on it and went down, crying with fear, into the embrace of the unknown. It was cold, and he gasped, breathing quickly. The water rushed into his lungs instead of the air that had always accompanied his act of breathing. The suffocation he experienced was like the pang of death. To him, it signified death. He had no conscious knowledge of death, but like every animal of the wild, he possessed the instinct of death. To him, it stood as the greatest of hurts. It was the very essence of the unknown. It was the sum of terrors of the unknown, the one culminating and unthinkable catastrophe that, that could happen to him, about which he knew nothing and about which he feared everything. He came to the surface, and the sweet air rushed into his open mouth. He did not go down again. Quite as though it had been a long established custom of his, he struck out with all of his legs and began to swim. The near bank was a yard away and he had come up with, it, with his back to it. And the first 
and the first thing his eyes rested upon was the opposite bank, to which he immediately began to swim. The stream was a small one, but in the pool it widened out to a score of feet. Midway in the passage, the current picked up the cub and swept him downstream. He was caught in the miniature rapid at the bottom of the pool. Here was a little chance for swimming. The quiet water had become suddenly angry. Sometimes he was under, sometimes on top. At all times, he was in a violent motion, now being turned over or around and again being smashed against a rock. And with every rock he struck, he yelped. His progress was a series of yelps from which might have been adduced the number of rocks he encountered. Below the rapid was a second pool, and here, captured by the eddy, he was gently borne to the bank and as gently deposited on a bed of gravel. He crawled frantically clear of the water and lay down. He had learned some more about the world. Water was not alive, yet it moved. Also, it looked as solid as the earth, but was without any solidity at all. His conclusion was that things were not always what they appeared to be. The cub's fear of the unknown was an inherited distrust and it had now been strengthened by experience. Thenceforth, in the nature of things, he would possess an abiding distrust of appearances. He would have to learn the reality of a thing before he could put his faith into it. One other adventure was destined for him that day. He had recollected that there was such a thing in the world as his mother and, there were, and then there came to him a feeling that he wanted her more than all the rest of the things in the world. Not only was his body tired with the adventures it had undergone, but his little brain was equally tired. In all the days he had lived, he had not worked so hard as on this day. Furthermore, he was sleepy. So he started out to look for the cave and his mother, feeling at the same time an overwhelming rush of loneliness and helplessness. He was sprawling along between some bushes when he heard a sharp, intimidating cry. There was a flash of yellow before his eyes. He saw a weasel leaping swiftly away from him. It was a small, live thing, but he had no fear. Then, before him at his feet, he saw an extremely small, live thing, only several inches long, a young weasel that, like himself, had disobediently gone out adventuring. It tried to retreat before him. He turned it over with his paw. It made a queer, grating noise. The next moment, the flash of yellow reappeared before his eyes. He heard again the intimidating cry, and the same instance received a sharp blow in the side of his neck and felt the sharp teeth of the mother weasel cut into his flesh. While he yelped and kayied and scrambled backward, he saw the mother weasel leap upon her young, her, her young one and disappear with it into the neighboring thicket. The cut of her teeth in, in his neck still hurt, but his feelings were hurt more grievously, and he sat down and weakly whimpered. This mother weasel was so small and so savage. He was yet to learn for, that for size and weight, the weasel was the most ferocious, vindictive, and terrible of all the killers of the wild. But a portion of his knowledge was quickly to be his. He was still whimpering when the mother weasel reappeared. She did not rush him, now that her young, now that her young one was safe. She approached more cautiously, and the cub had full opportunity to observe her lean, snake-like body and her head erect, eager, and snake-like itself. Her sharp, menacing cry sent the hair bristling along his back, and he snarled warningly at her. She came closer and closer. There was a leap swifter than his unpracticed sight, and the lean, yellow body disappeared for a moment out of the field of his vision. The next moment, she was at his throat, her teeth buried in his hair and flesh. At first, he snarled and tried to fight, but he was very young, and this was only his first day in the world, and his snarl became a whimper, his fight a struggle to escape. The weasel never relaxed her hold. She hung on, striving to press down with her teeth to the great vein where his lifeblood bubbled. The weasel had, was a drinker of blood, and it was ever her preference to drink from the throat of life itself. The gray cub would have, the gray cub would have died, and there would have been a, no story to write about him had not the she-wolf come bounding through the bushes. The weasel let go of the cub and flashed at the she-wolf's throat, missing but getting a hold on the jaw instead. The she-wolf flirted her head like a snap of a whip, breaking the weasel's hold and flinging it high in the air. And still in the air, the she-wolf's jaws closed in the lean yellow body and the weasel knew death between the crunching teeth. The cub experienced another access of aff affection on the part of his mother. Her joy at finding him seemed even greater than his joy at being found. She nozzled him and crest him and licked the cuts made in him by the weasel's teeth. Then, between them, mother and cub, they ate the blood drinker, and after that, 
went back to the cave and slept. Hello, everybody. We are back reading the story of Dr. Doolittle. And today, I think, if we're lucky, we are going to finish this book. So one more time, I want to introduce you all to the star of our story. And that is, can anybody guess? Who is it? 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 Ah, oh, Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> yes, Dr. Doolittle. And remember, this little guy was a, a toy that came after a movie that I saw as a little kid. And um, this actor that played Dr. Doolittle, his name was Rex Harrison. Now there have been many versions of this story. It's an old favorite. So I'm sure some of you might have seen one of the versions and you can uh, see them probably um, in uh, rentals or maybe even on Hulu or maybe even on Netflix. I don't know, but Dr. Doolittle is a very famous story. And so like I said, today we are hopefully going to get to the very end. There are just two more chapters. So we got to get started. Aha, you have to sit and listen. All right. The 20th chapter, The Fisherman's Town. Now, if you remember what we just read before, chapter 20 was chapter 19, of course. And in chapter 19, they found the boy's uncle, the fisherman, on this rock down a cave. And this rock is like completely empty in the middle of the ocean. No trees, no food, just rock. So here's where we pick up. Gently then, very gently, the doctor woke the man up. But just at the moment that he woke him up, the match went out again. And the man thought it was Ben Ali, remember that's the pirate, coming back and he began to punch the doctor in the dark. But when John Doolittle told him who it was and that he had his little nephew safely on board his ship, the man was tremendously glad and said he was so sorry that he had fought the doctor. He had not hurt him much though, because it was too dark to punch properly. And then he gave the doctor a pinch of snuff. And the man told him how the Barbary dragon had pulled him onto this rock and left him there when he wouldn't promise to become a pirate. He also told him how he used to sleep in the hole because there was no house on this rock to keep him warm. And then he said, for days I've had nothing to eat and drink. I've lived on snuff. There you are, said Jip. <laughs> what did I tell you? Ruff, ruff, ruff. So they struck some more matches and made their way out through the passage into the daylight. And the doctor hurried the man down to the boat to get some soup. And when the animals and the little boy saw the doctor and Jip coming back to the ship with the red haired man, they began to cheer and to yell and to dance on the boat. And the swallows up above started whistling at the top of their voices, thousands, millions of them, to show that they too were glad that the boy's brave uncle had been found. The noise they made was so great that the sailors far out at sea thought a terrible storm was brewing. Hark to the gale howling in the east, they said. And Jip was awfully proud of himself, though he tried hard not to be conceited. When Dab Dab came to him, he said, Jip, I had no idea you were so clever. Quack, quack. He just tossed his head and answered, Oh, that's nothing special, but it takes a dog to find a man. You know, birds are no good for a game like that. Then the doctor asked the red-haired fisherman where his home was. And when he had told him, the doctor asked the swallows to guide the ship there first. 
And they had gone to the land which the man had spoken of, and they saw the little fishing town at the foot of the rocky mountain, and the man pointed out the house where he lived. And while they were letting down the anchor, the little boy's mother, who was also the man's sister, came running down to the shore to meet them, laughing and crying at the same time. She had been sitting on the hill for 20 days, watching the sea and waiting for them to return. And she kissed the doctor many times so that he giggled and blushed like a schoolgirl. And she tried to kiss Jip too, but he ran away and hid inside the ship. It's silly business, this kissing, he said. It don't hold to it. Let her go and kiss Gub Gub if she must kiss something. The fisherman and his sister didn't want the doctor to go away again in a hurry. They begged him to spend a few days with them. So John Doolittle and his animals had to stay at their house a whole Saturday and Sunday and half of Monday. And all the little boys of the fishing village went down to the beach and pointed to the great ship anchored there. And they said to one another in whispers, look, that was a pirate ship the most terrible pirate that ever sailed the seven seas. That old gentleman with the high hat who's staying up there at Miss Trevelyan's, he took the ship away from the Barbary dra dragon and made hi him into a farmer. <laughs> Who would have thought of that, of him? Him so gentle and like <laughs> all that. Look at the great red sails. Ain't she a wicked looking ship and fast? My! And those two days and a half, the doctor stayed at the little fishing town. The people kept asking him out to teas and luncheons and dinners and parties. And all the ladies sent him boxes of flowers and candies. And the village band played tunes under his window every night. I'm going to go back. The fisherman. The fisherman's daughter, the fisherman and his sister. The fisherman and his sister didn't want the doctor to go away again in such a hurry. So they begged him to spend a few days with them. So John Doolittle and his animals had to stay at their house a whole Saturday, a whole Sunday, and half of Monday. And all the little boys of the fishing village went down to the beach and pointed at the great ship anchored there and said to one another in whispers, look, look, that was the pirate ship, the most terrible pirate that ever sailed the seven seas. That old gentleman over there with the high hat who's staying up there at Mrs. T's, he took that ship away from the Barbary dragon and he made him into a farmer. <laughs> Who'd have thought that of him? Him so gentle like and all. Look at that great red sails. Ain't she a wicked looking ship? That and fast. <gasps> My. And those two days and a half, the doctor stayed at the little fishing village. The people kept asking him out to teas and luncheons and dinners and parties. All the ladies sent him with boxes of flowers and candies, and the village band played tunes under his window every night. At last, the doctor said, oh, Good people, I must be going home now. You have really been most kind. I shall always remember it, but I must go home, for I have things to do. Then, just as the doctor was about to leave, the mayor of the town came down to the street, and a lot of other people in grand clothes along with him. And the mayor stopped before the house where the doctor was living, and everybody in the village gathered round to see what was going to happen. After six page boys had blown on these shiny trumpets to make the people stop talking, the doctor came onto the steps and the mayor spoke. Doc 
Dr. John Doolittle, said he, it's a great pleasure for me to present to the man who rid the seas of the dragon of Barbary this little token from the grateful people of our worthy town. And the mayor took from his pocket a little tissue paper packet and opening it very carefully, he handed it to the doctor. A perfectly beautiful watch with real diamonds in the back was what was there. And the mayor handed it to the doctor. Then the mayor pulled out of his pocket a still larger parcel and said, where's the dog? Then everybody started to hunt for Jip. And at last, Dab Dab found him on the other side of the village in the stable yard where all the dogs of the countryside were standing round him speechless with admiration and respect. When Jip was brought to the doctor's side, the mayor opened a large parcel and inside was a dog collar made of solid gold. And a great murmur of wonder went through the village folk as the mayor bent down and fastened it around the dog's neck with his own hands. For written on the collar in big letters were these words, Jip, the cleverest dog in the world. Then the whole crowd moved down to the beach to see them off. And after the red-haired fisherman and his sister and the little boy had thanked the doctor and his dog over and over and over again, the great swift ship with the red sails was turned once more towards Puddleby and they sailed out to sea while the village band played the music on the shore. And next up, we're going to read the last chapter. And so the time has come that we are going to read the very last chapter. It's the 21st chapter and it's called The Last Chapter, Home Again. March winds had come and gone, April showers were over, May's buds had opened into flower, and the June sun was shining on the pleasant fields when John Doolittle at last got back to his own country. But he did not go home to Puddleby at first. No, first he went traveling through the land with the push me pull you in a gypsy wagon, stopping at all the country fairs. And there, with the acrobats on one side of them and the Punch and Judy shows going on on the other, they would hang a big sign which read, Come and see the marvelous two-headed animal from the jungles of Africa. Admission, six pence. And the Push Me Pull You would stay inside the wagon while all the other animals would lie about underneath. The doctor sat in a chair in front, taking the sixpence and smiling on the people as they went in. And Dab Dab was kept busy all the time scolding him because he would let the children in for free when she was not looking. And the menagerie keepers and the circus men came and asked the doctor to sell them this strange creature saying that they would pay a tremendous lot of money for him. But the doctor always shook his head and said, no, the push me pull you shall never be shut up in a cage. He shall be free to always come and go like you and me. Many curious sights and happenings they saw while they were wandering, but they all seemed quite ordinary, quite ordinary after the great things that they had seen in the foreign lands. It was very interesting at first, being sort of part of a circus, but after a few weeks they all got dreadfully tired of it, and the doctor and all of them were longing to go home. But so many people came flocking around the little wagon, 
and paid the sixpence to go inside while the doctor sat in front. See the push me pull you? That was very soon the doctor was able to give up the showman life. So one fine day when the hollyhocks were in full bloom, he came back to Puddleby, a rich man, to live in the little house with the big garden. And the old lame horse in the stable was so glad to see him. And so were the swallows who had already built their nests under the eaves of the roof and had young ones. And Dab Dab was glad too to get back to the house she knew so well although there was a terrible lot of dusting to be done with cobwebs everywhere. And after Jip had gone and shown his golden collar to the conceited collie next door, he came back and began running around the garden like a crazy thing, looking for the bones he had buried long ago and chasing rats out of the tool shed, while Gub Gub dug up the horseradish, which had grown three feet high in the corner of the garden wall. Even when the doctor had filled the old money box on the dresser's shelf, he still had a lot of money left, and he had to get three more money boxes just as big to put the rest in. He paid the grocer for the food that he lent him on the journey, and he bought another piano and put the white mice back in it because they said the bureau drawer was a little drafty. Money, he said. It's a terrible nuisance, but it's also nice to not have to worry about. Yes, said Dab Dab, who was toasting muffins for his tea. It is indeed. And when the winter came and the snow flew against the kitchen window, the doctor and his animals would sit around that big warm fire after supper and he would read aloud to them out of his books. But far away in Africa where the monkeys chattered in the palm trees before they went to bed under the big yellow moon, they would say to one another, I wonder what the good man is doing now. He, over there in the land of those men, do you think he'll ever come back? And Polynesia would squeak out from the vines. I think he will. I guess he will. I hope he will. And the crocodile would grunt up from the black mud of the river. I'm sure he will. Now go to sleep. The end. Thank you for coming today and listening to these great chapter books. We hope you can get to the library soon and get your own copies, or you can find these stories online. They are all public domain and available on many websites. Well, that's all the time we have today. So until next time, keep reading.